We are here today at the Marriott in Los Angeles filming uh, interviews for the Hamilton College Jazz Archives. We have with us today one of the world's most outstanding jazz guitarists, Herb Ellis. Pleased hey. to meet you. Nice meeting you. Yes, I wanted to uh, ask you some things about how you got started playing guitar. Oh, let me see. Well, I first played the harmonica when I was three. So I'm told, and it must be true because I can still play it a little bit, <laughs> very little. And uh, then uh, my parents bought me a banjo when I was seven, and I learned to play that. And then somebody, somebody left a guitar at our house, and my older brother wanted to accompany me, so, but, so he tuned the guitar incorrectly. You know, I, I can't, it'd be hard to, to show you, but it, it well, it was a cheap shot. You could make the chords with just one finger, see? <laughs> and so, being an older brother, uh, he did everything much better than I did. So I s saw that I had him. So I, I got a book from Sears Roebuck that said, learn to play the guitar in five minutes. And I believed it. <laughs> so and I learned to play it correctly, and I showed him how to play. And, then, and so that was a good lick for me. Let me ask you about your... Um experience at North Texas State. Oh yeah, right. Well, I went there, let me see, in 1870, <laughs> almost, uh, wait a minute, eight, uh, 19, 41 and 42, I went there. And uh, it was great. Uh, it's really gotten a lot larger now, you know. And it's a very good school. And I roomed with a, a bunch of guys, and we had a house together. And they were all musicians and all jazz players. So I actually learned more staying there with them and listening to all the records they had. Well, I learned some from school, but we, got to, we played. We had a, a, a drummer, a bassist, a pianist, myself, and a trumpet and a saxophone. So we played all the time, you know, so that was a big help. Uh, with the, uh, what did they have in the school systems at that time in terms of jazz studies? Well, there, there, were, there were no jazz studies at all. We just, uh, we all banded together, and uh, in music appreciation, we, we were all good students, so they would listen to us, and we asked if we could bring our jazz records in and play them along with the classical records, and they said, okay. So, uh, and with that, we were instrumental in starting the, uh, the jazz part of the school. Good, good. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you, uh got started working with the, probably one of the most famous trios in all of jazz. Right. Oscar Peterson and Ray Brown. All right. I was playing, <clears throat> I had been with bands, I'd been with Jimmy Dorsey, and uh, the three of us in the Jimmy Dorsey band, the bassist and the pianist myself, formed a trio, sort of a la Night Cole, and, uh, and we were playing in Buffalo, and we, we played in the same hotel for all months at a time. And the people from Canada, there, there's no liquor on, in Canada on Sundays at that time. So, but they come over for the music. And a lot of them came and, uh, and one night they brought Oscar Peterson with them. And he sat in and played with us. And then after the job, Oscar and I went out and we played in, uh, in a different place or so. You know. And uh, from that meeting and playing together, uh, about uh, four years later, when he needed a, a guitarist for his group, he asked for me. And I was not that well known. He could have had anybody he wanted to, but thank God he chose me. You know, uh, that says something about musicians striking a certain chemistry. That's true. Can you tell us other musicians that you've had that chemistry with? Oh, let me see. Well, there's a lot of them. I have it with Sweet Edison. He's here at the festival, you know. And uh, I have it with uh, Jake Hanna, the drummer. And of course, I have it with Ray Brown to a great extent. You know, we, we love to play together. So uh, there could be more, but I can't name them all. Could you also explain to guitarists how that it takes an impeccable sense of time to play in a trio with no drums. Yes, it does. Yeah, you got in a trio with no drums for the guitarist. You got to work with the pianist, you know, 
and the basses, of course. But playing with the piano, I, I don't know if I'd uh, categorize it as being very difficult, but uh, you have to learn how to keep out of each other's way. You know, that's the main thing, no, learning what not to play, you know, which is a very important thing in music, in jazz music or any kind of music. Sometimes the best thing you'll do, the best music you'll make is something that you leave out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've tried to learn that. Accompanying is an art, isn't it? I'll say it is. And I, uh, well, see, I think I do it well because uh, I love to accompany. See, I love to accompany people. I know a lot of guitarists and pianists too, I suppose, that uh, they just like to solo. They really don't like to accompany them. So consequently, they don't do it very well. Uh, with this trio, tell us some of the maybe more humorous things that happened in oh, the trio. All right. Um, we were in Los Angeles. You're playing at some club. And we had Sunday, we had off. So uh, it, we'd, Ray and I had re roomed together and we had played golf. And uh, it was late in the afternoon. So we had this idea. I oh, was coming home from playing golf and I saw this advertisement in a drugstore. And it said, dye your hair any color and then it'll, it'll wash right out at the first time you wash your hair, you know. So I had an idea and Ray went for it, but he was kind of leery about it. See, I had bright red hair at the time and Ray's was jet black. So he dyed his hair a bilious red and I dyed mine black. And then we called Oscar and told him that we had to see him. And he said, well, what do you have to see me for? I said, I'll see you tomorrow night, you know. And so I said, no, it's, it's very important. We really, we really have to see you. So he said, well, okay. He said, I'm on my way to dinner. I said, I can't be long with you guys. You know, we said, oh, just come by and we'll talk about it. So we're sitting there and Ray's reading the paper in his, in his robe and uh, Oscar knocks. And I let, open the door to let him in. And there I am with that jet black hair and Ray with this bilious red hair. And he looks at me and he said, Herb? He looks at Ray and he said, Ray? He said, what do you guys want to see me about? I mean, not, didn't crack at all, nothing. And we said, well, you know, don't you get it? He said, the only thing I get it is that you're making me late for dinner. Hi. <laughs> That's composure. <laughs> Woo. Uh, how much is humor a part of the very fabric of jazz? Oh, I think it's a great part. And uh, you can see a, lo a lot of players who don't put any humor in it, you know. And you can tell. I mean, it's very sad. They may play the notes, but it's dreary, you know. Uh, humor and, uh, and uh, melancholy is nice. To get, you know, it's sometimes a little sadness, but uh, humor is, oh boy. I don't have any use for somebody who plays with no humor. It's very sterile, you know. Uh huh. Tell us about some of your duo work with your past. Well, God bless him. Uh, I loved him, and uh, he was my favorite guitarist, and still is. Um, and we had a way of playing. We could play. We we knew how to back each other up, but then we could both play at the same time. You know, you may have heard us do that. And uh, I mean, both soloing at the same time. And that, I was going to say, it could be difficult. It can be difficult. But with him, we knew, we just fit with each other, you know. But the reason was we we're both very selfless, you know. Uh, he towards my playing and I towards his playing. So when we would play those things where we're both playing at the same time, and that's dangerous territory, we could do it just like it was written out for us. Amazing. A kind of dialogue? Yes, exactly. That's a very good way to put it. Yeah. Now, you've played some behind Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, yes. How is it different to accompany a singer, especially well, a great singer? Oh, and she is the greatest. Uh, Ella, for instance, when she was singing uh, the verse to a tune, Out of Time, you know, uh, and you're playing for her, you just kind of have to tag after her because she goes right through it, bang, you know. Now, uh, somebody like, uh, um, 
oh, I can't think of their names, but it doesn't matter. Maybe I'll think of it later. Sing way behind the beat. I mean way behind the beat. You gotta be tugging them like a, with a rope, you know. Not that it's bad, it's just that you have to learn how to do with each singer. Yeah. Uh, about the time element, this, this tugging feeling, uh, that is a essential part of jazz. Can you kind of describe that? The, the jazz beat, you mean? As, you know, for instance, with a, a lead player either pushing ahead in the beat oh. or pulling behind as compared to the rhythm section. Oh, I see. Well, in my opinion, the rhythm section sounds best when the drummer plays right on the beat. And the bass, bass is, is just a hair on top of that. Not enough that you get a, you know, it's just a little edge. That's the way Ray Brown plays and other players too. And, uh, and then the pianist, they just have to know what to leave out and the guitarist has to learn how to play with the rhythm section, but with the pianist, that's the thing you have, to, so you don't get, to get in each other's way, you know. So that's the way uh, an optimum uh, rhythm section would work for me. Or that's the optimum way it would work, let me see. Now, you say that uh, Charlie Christian was one of your influences. Absolutely. Explain his influence and then talk about how the jazz guitar has evolved from that time. Well, Charlie Christian, uh, I mean, I, when I first heard him, I was just absolutely stunned, you know. And uh, I was a kid at that time, and uh, I could play a lot of notes. I mean, a lot of notes, but they were worthless, you know. So uh, when I heard him, and it got to me, so then I started playing from playing a million notes to almost no notes. I mean, each note had to be sent to me directly from heaven before I would consider playing it. <laughs> and somewhere in there, I struck a happy medium, you know. And uh, Charlie changed the whole nature of the guitar. He played it. Uh, sort of un, un, the way people had played guitar, guitaristic, sort of unlike that, because he played more like a tenor saxophone would play, you know, and uh, he changed the whole course of uh, solo guitaring. And you know that he died when he was 23. Yeah, he could still be living and playing. Uh, so. that's, that's another theme in jazz is the early and tragic death of some of its greatest yeah, well, players. Yeah, that's true. He, uh, he had tuberculosis. And uh, uh, Jimmy Blanton died when he was 21, the bassist with uh, Duke Ellington. How has the guitar play, playing and styles evolved? Uh, well, the two main stylists, uh, I believe, would be uh, Charlie Christian and Django Reinhardt. And Charlie is, is more right in the face, you know, bang, just lay it right in there. And uh, Django sort of flirts with it. I don't mean that negatively. I mean, very good. But he plays a lot more notes than Charlie would play with. And Charlie doesn't need to play that many because he can say it with just a few, you see. So that's the two uh, definite schools. And People can play a little bit of both schools, but uh, usually come from you lean towards one school or another one, you know. And uh, then there are chordal players that, that play uh, when they have a solo. They play chords and and uh, maybe a couple of notes alone and in the chords, you know. That's chord stylists, and there are not too many of those. Uh, the, the person who plays that best and uh, is uh, George Van Epps. He made that style popular. He's a great guitarist. Still playing. He's even older than I am, and that's hard to do. Tell us a little about that, uh, the story you told us you were going to tell us about the Dorsey band. Oh, yeah. Well, I, uh, I went with Jimmy Dorsey, and uh, I played, had two guitars. I had a rhythm guitar and an electric guitar. So uh, there was a, a guitar feature in the band and I knew about it so I got the record before I joined him and I learned it and it was sort of difficult it was a, a chord solo with a few single notes and it was the melody so you had to play it pretty close to the way it was written you know and I was a very bad reader in those days 
and uh, so we were on the job the first night and I, Jimmy gave me a couple of solos here and there and then he pulled this number of sorghum switch I'll never forget it was number 43 and uh, so he was about to beat it off and he said oh Herb I'm sorry he said uh, this is a guitar solo and, and I understand it's rather difficult he said why don't you just take it home and we'll play it a couple of nights from now. I, I'm looking at it like I could read it, see, but I had it memorized. And I said, no, Jimmy, I said, I think I can get through it. Let's try it. So he, we did, and I played it perfectly. Well, or almost perfectly. That was the night that the arrangers came in and brought their arrangements, and then he'd tell them what they're going to do next. So he got all the arrangements together after that, and he said, I want you to write for Herb. You know, I said, I want, it, want him playing lead and harmony parts. He said that he can read anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you set yourself. Ooh, I did. <laughs> so then you had, did, did you have to back it up from that point on? Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, but see, I had him so, so buffalo by that. If the, they bring in a part that I couldn't, sight read, which is often, I'd tell him that it didn't lay well, which is a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> but he believed me because he thought if, if I couldn't play it right off, then it was unplayable, you know. So it worked. <laughs> How is uh, doing studio work different from playing live? Well, for me, uh, and I think for most of the people who play studio work, it's just a way of earning a living. You know, uh, you could play with a, a big orchestra, maybe backing a vocalist, and uh, then you could be doing a rock session, you know, and go, go from there to a country session. So, so you just have to play all styles, you know. And being a guitarist, you have to play every instrument. You have to play the guitar, the banjo, the ukulele, the mandolin, you know, and. Uh, the only gratifying thing about it for me was the money because, uh, well, not being a good reader, I never enjoyed it, you know. And this, the only thing is you might play uh, with a big orchestra, uh, maybe written by Johnny Mandel, you might play some nice music once in a while, but most of it's trash. <laughs> you know, in the studios, if they're doing a multi-track recording, yeah. Sometimes you get four or five chances at it. Yeah. How is that different from playing a nightclub where it's your time turn to solo and that's it? The audience gets what you give that night. You mean uh, in a jazz situation? Or oh well, first of all, uh, that's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it can be a little nerve wracking if you're uh, if you're doing a big concert, you know. Uh, but uh, jazz players just they just love that. It's, it's just what we do, you know. And uh, I know that we uh, can make a mistake and turn it into a symphony, you know. That's what you have to learn to do. You talked about Charlie Christian and playing just a few notes, but the right notes. Absolutely. That process, it, 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 I have a term for that process, but I'd like you to expand on it. That is editing as much as creating. Edit, that's a good way to put it, you know. Uh, well, I can count, I really, uh, it says it itself though, you know. And, but learning what to edit, that's, that's the secret, you know. Learning, and once you learn to edit like that, then your, your melodies seem to get a lot stronger for some reason, you know. And uh, I, can, I can tell by the audience reaction if I'm playing really good. And when you're playing good, it's more melodic, you know. That's what Lester Young, Prez, used to say. He called everybody a lady, like Lady Ellis. He'd say, well, I was, we're playing on the stage. And if I played particularly well, he'd say, sing me a song, Lady, De lady Ellis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other interesting stories with musicians that you've played with? And you've played with some greats. Oh, I know I have. I'm just trying to think. Uh, no, well, if I think of one, I'll come up with it. Yeah. In the meantime, tell us about what it was like to be a musician 
and some of the earlier years and kind of what the pay was like? In the earlier years? Well, uh, I was with Glenn Gray. You probably won't even remember that name, but that was a, an orchestra. And uh, they, they paid pretty well. And then when I went with Jimmy, I made uh, uh, more. And this is back in the, in the, in the 40s, you know, early 40s. And uh, I finally got to making, now this will seem ridiculous, 175 a week. But back at that time, that was big money, you know. And then uh, I joined Oscar and uh, my price went up some. And, uh, but I'm just amazed that, and when we would travel with Oscar and Jazz at the Philharmonic in Europe, Norman uh, had us booked at the very best hotels, you know, and we could afford it on, on the money we made. Of course, now that's a different ball game. I don't know if we'd be able to stay there or not. <laughs> d d describe how things are for you now. They're very good. Uh, uh, I uh, there's something to be said for playing as long as as I have. You know, I'm very blessed. The Lord has blessed me. I don't have arthritis, and my health is good. So. Uh, I, I play about half the time now, you know, and uh, even if I didn't have to play financially, I still play because I love it, you know, it's what I do. Keeps me young, or thinking I'm young anyway. I want to ask you about what it must feel like to have a guitar named after you. Oh, that's, that's a really a great feeling, you know. And uh, uh, even better is a lot of people like the guitar and they buy it, you know. Not in the same way that they'd buy a rock guitar, because of, but uh, it does pretty well for, for a guitarist. And, uh, and I'm very proud of the fact, you know, it, it makes you feel great, it really does. How did the Gibson Company, uh, what questions did they ask you in, in building the guitar? They asked me, uh, you know, what style I wanted, and uh, they had a guitar that I played since 1953 that uh, mine is very similar. That was the ES-175, and they call mine the Herbellus ES-165. And the only difference really is that uh, the uh, ES-175 is made out of plywood, and mine is made out of real wood. You know, it, it's just a better, better quality guitar. And it's, it's pretty reasonable, too. Are there young players today that you think try to play like you? I couldn't name them, but there, there are quite a few. You'd be amazed, you know. And uh, that's, really a, that's really a compliment, uh -huh. you know. I wish I could think of some of them, but it's hard for me to think of what I had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> Oh, it's delightful. Tell us uh, another time, you, you, you said you were going to tell us a story about where you didn't get paid at all, was, was that it? Where I didn't get paid at all? I don't, you must have me mixed up with somebody. <laughs> I don't remember that. Uh, didn't get paid at all. I think if I didn't get paid at all, I'd remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've gotten so little that it's almost like not getting paid at all. So, who is a guitarist? Name a couple of guitarists on the scene that you see coming up that are oh, continuing to breathe life into the guitar playing. Yeah, uh, uh, Al Cohen's son, Joe Cohen, plays very well, and uh, oh, uh, Bucky Pizzarelli's son, John, John Pizzarelli. He's kind of a star now. He sings, you know. He's getting rather popular, and he plays real good. And if I think of any more, there are a lot of them, but I just, I'm, I, don't, I don't keep them readily at my, at my hand. Anyway, that's about all I know about everything. <laughs> well, I just would like to ask you then if you'll give us a word of, of wisdom, if you, if you had a word to say to young guitarists coming up, wanting to involve themselves in this music, what would it be? You mean musically? <laughs> yeah. I would tell them that it's necessary, vital, 
that they learn to play what they say, you know, when you're humming along with what you're playing, you know. Uh, Joe Pass did it, Wes Cumber did it, uh, Clark Terry does it, all the good, Oscar does it, Ray Brown does it. Anybody who plays, you can't tell horn players because they got something in their mouth, you know, but the ones, you ask them and, and they, uh, they're playing what they're singing, you know. And that way, you make you make your own music, see? It has to be, because you, you're singing it. And another thing, you won't sing a bunch of silly stuff. You might play a bunch of silly stuff, but you won't sing about, blah, 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 you know, you won't, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, uh, it really is big, it's the one thing I would say that is absolutely vital. So that music is coming out of you. Absolutely, yeah. That is marvelous, that is marvelous. Well, we've had a marvelous interview here with uh, just a champion of the guitar, Herb Ellis, re recording for Hamilton Jazz Archives. Thank you.